Hey YouTube, it's Roman. Today I want to talk about the black scholes merton partial differential equation. I'm going to be running through the derivation technically, subtly explaining some of the different steps that I'm going through while providing a qualitative explanation of each of the variables and what they mean. Uh, and I think that is going to nicely tie into a future video on the solution to the partial differential equation to produce an options price. Back on the iPad today, let's go ahead and get started and develop this notion of a portfolio. So I'm gonna say our portfolio pi is going to consist of an equity derivative. You can think of this as a call option. And we're gonna represent that by D. Now D is a function of the underlying S and time. And then we're also going to be short the underlying. So we're gonna say minus S. So in this initial construction, we have our portfolio here. We have the value of our equity derivative, and then we have the equity itself. So we have a long position in the derivative. We have a short position in the underlying stock. And this combination here is our portfolio pi. Let's see if we can work some magic to remove the randomness from this portfolio. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, first we need to assume that the underlying equity follows some sort of model. So we're just gonna go with geometric Brownian motion, which is given by DSS mu dt plus sigma dwt, where wt is a standard Brownian motion. Okay, so the only randomness from this portfolio is induced by the equity and this Brownian motion here. Everything else is deterministic. So our goal is going to be to see if we can create a combination of this equity derivative and equity to remove this Brownian motion term. To accomplish this, let's look at a small change in our original portfolio. So we can do that by specifying mathematically d pi, which represents a small change in that original portfolio. Now we have to consider a small change in each of the components of that portfolio. So I'm going to say d, d is a function of s and t, less ds. So we're looking at a small change in our short position of the underlying equity, and we're looking at a small change in our long position of our equity derivative. Fortunately for us, we've seen ds before. We assume geometric Brownian motion, thus ds is given by this guy right here, if we were to multiply this s to both sides of the equation. Now, if we look at our equity derivative pricing function, we can see that it is a function of S. That is the underlying equity, and we assume that the underlying equity follows a geometric Brownian motion. So we can see that this Brownian motion term is inducing randomness in our portfolio via our short position in the equity itself and the long position in our equity derivative. So we know ds, what, what the heck is dd? Well, Ito's lemma allows us to find the differential of a time-dependent function of a stochastic process. Thus, we can actually rewrite dd as the partial derivative of d with respect to time multiplied by a time differential plus the partial derivative of d with respect to the underlying s times the differential of s plus one half the partial derivative with respect to s this time the second order partial derivative multiplied by the differential of s squared i want to pull it back in for a second and say i know that this may look a little scary it may look like a, a pretty big derivation but you don't necessarily have to completely understand Ito's lemma and its, its derivation in its entirety to understand its application in this setting. All we're saying is Ito's lemma allows us to find this part of the equation, which is the differential of our equity derivative pricing function. So we're saying a small change in our equity derivative value is given by this guy here which is given to us by Ito's lemma. Now that we know what makes up a change in our equity derivative, I wanna highlight two aspects of that change. Mainly, I wanna highlight this term and this term, because those are the only two terms that are inducing randomness in the change 
of our equity derivatives value. We know that the only other source of randomness in this portfolio is also given by our equity position via geometric Brownian motion. Starting with the second term here, I wanna consider ds squared. So if you recall earlier, we follow geometric Brownian motion, which is given by dss mu dt sigma dwt. And if we are to multiply both sides of the equation by s, then we're actually given ds. So we can find ds squared easily by saying mu dt s plus sigma dwt s squared. Now we can very simply just FOIL and find all of these terms. So our first term is gonna be mu dt s squared. The second term is gonna be two mu dt s squared sigma dwt. And then the last term is going to be sigma dwt s squared. Just like I brought in Ito's lemma, I'm gonna bring in some rules from stochastic calculus. Interestingly enough, dt squared is equal to dt dwt, which is equal to zero, and dwt squared is equal to dt. So if we consider these rules here, we see the squared goes to this dt, this guy goes away. We see dt times dwt, this guy goes away, and we see this square goes to dwt, Thus, we're left with sigma squared dt s squared. So that is going to be the same thing as ds squared. I wanna keep the scope of the goal in mind, especially after going through some math. So we still wanna create a risk neutral portfolio, but we haven't actually done anything yet. We're still trying to find the portfolio differential and we used Ito's lemma and some tools from stochastic calculus to help us develop some of the components to that change in equity derivative term that we otherwise wouldn't have been able to find. Having solved for ds squared, we can rewrite the small change in our equity derivative as dd as a function of the underlying and time is equal to the partial derivative of d with respect to t times the time differential plus the partial derivative of d with respect to the underlying times the differential of the underlying plus one half the second order partial derivative with respect to the underlying. But this time, instead of ds squared, we know what ds squared is. It is sigma squared dts squared. And I'm going to write that as sigma squared s squared dt. So now, we can start to turn our attention towards this second term here because using our knowledge of stochastic calculus, we were able to determine that the only term in our equity differential that's receiving randomness induced by geometric Brownian motion is this guy here. This is actually deterministic. We know what the spot price is of the underlying asset whenever we want. You can always hop on Yahoo Finance and, and figure out what the price of some arbitrary asset is. Uh, and then this is also deterministic in nature. So the only portion of our equity derivative that is receiving randomness via geometric Brownian motion is going to be this second term here. This is where things start to get very cool. So if you recall our original portfolio, pi is equal to dst less s. So we have this long position equity derivative, and we have the corresponding short position in the equity, and that is going to be our portfolio pi. Well, if I was to say to you, hey, how many shares do you have to hold in your portfolio? You would say, hey, Roman, I don't have to hold anything. I can hold whatever I'd like to whenever I want. I can hop on E-Trade. I can sell my Microsoft shares. I can short Microsoft shares. I could do you know, whatever it is I'd like to do. And that's my main point at, at this stage in this proof is all of the math that we've done up until this point has just been contingent on these two components of our portfolio, not the quantity of these two components. You're free to short however many shares of stock you would like. So in order to denote that in this portfolio's construction, instead of just saying minus S, I'm gonna say minus PS. 
where P represents the amount of shares that we're shorting. Now consider the portfolio differential. If we were to rewrite the portfolio differential, D pi is equal to DD ST minus P DS, because P is just a constant. So we are, we're allowed to distribute that differential through. Take a look at what happens. We only have randomness induced by DS, the geometric Brownian motion term. But where is DS in the differential of our portfolio? Well, it only occurs in two places. If you look, DDST is given here by all three of these terms. And the only place that DS occurs in the equity derivatives differential is right here. Similarly, in our short position of the equity, the only place that DS occurs, and it's the only component, is right here. But we have the freedom to choose a P. So if we have the freedom to choose a P, and P is already negative given we have a short position in this equity, what if we chose P to be the partial derivative of D with respect to the underlying? Then if we were to do that, both of the DSs would cancel out. The notion of removing randomness caused from geometric Brownian motion via the underlying asset is a delta hedge. That's what it's called. It's called a delta hedge. So essentially what we're doing is we're developing a delta hedge in our portfolio. Let's just go ahead and do it mathematically. We're going to hold P shares. So we're going to define P as the partial derivative of D with respect to the underlying, which is synonymous with what the literature calls delta. And delta is a known value. So we can hold delta shares of the stock and that implies that our portfolio differential is now going to consist of, again, from Ito's lemma, we have the partial derivative of D with respect to T times the time differential, plus the partial derivative with respect to the underlying times this differential of the underlying, plus one half the second order partial derivative with respect to the underlying sigma squared S squared DT. And that is going to be our D, D, S, T. And we also have our equity component. So we're gonna say less P, D, S, given by this guy here. But P is now defined as the partial derivative of D with respect to the underlying. So we are less the partial derivative of D with respect to the underlying times D, S, and this is our equity component, D, S. If this is the case, these two terms are exactly the same and cancel out. Thus, we're left with D pi is equal to partial derivative of D with respect to T times the time differential plus one half second order partial derivative with respect to the underlying of sigma squared S squared dt and our increment in portfolio value our small change in portfolio value is effectively risk neutral by holding delta shares of stock in our short position we are effectively constructing a risk neutral portfolio that means that the change in our portfolio is no longer random it's deterministic if the change in our portfolio value is no longer random and we no longer have any risk, we can't possibly be earning a rate of return greater than the risk-free rate of return. Therefore, it's fair to say that d pi at small change is equivalent to the risk-free rate times our portfolio value times some small change in time. And making this final substitution, we can say r pi dt substituting this in for d pi is equal to two of our components left over from Ito's lemma. And if you notice now, these dt terms cancel from both sides and we are simply left with r pi is equal to 
partial derivative of d with respect to time plus one half the second order partial derivative with respect to the underlying sigma squared s squared. And this is the Black Scholes Merton PDE. So at a high level, what did we do? Well, if we scroll all the way back up here, we constructed a portfolio that consisted of a long position in an equity derivative and a short position in the corresponding equity. Then we assumed some model for that equity, and that allowed us to find this portfolio differential. Now this portfolio differential is actually a stochastic differential equation. And to solve the stochastic differential equation, we need to remove the randomness that's induced by Brownian motion. And we do that by cleverly holding delta shares of stock. By cleverly holding delta shares of stock, we notice that the randomness cancels out and we are left with an ordinary partial differential equation. And now we can use all of our tools that we know and love to help us solve this partial differential equation. It also just so happens that this equation is a very well-known form, thus we have an analytical solution available to us. This isn't always the case with stochastic differential equations. Sometimes you may have to use uh, numerical methods to solve, but uh, in this case, in the case of a black scholes merton we do know the analytical solution. I want to thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Uh, please subscribe. It helps me out a lot. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. Uh, anything specific, always feel free to email me. I'm happy to help however I can. Um, I really appreciate all of the video suggestions. Please keep them coming, and I'll do my best to try to, try to make it to all of them. Um, it's a, a very deep C, the, uh, the option pricing C, but it's very interesting. There's a lot of very cool emerging techniques, um, especially in the deep learning space surrounding uh, some of this stuff that builds on the foundation of uh, our knowledge for mathematical finance, rather than just kind of like wiping the slate clean and you know just taking a, a pure ML deep learning approach. Uh, we're we're kind of building on the foundation of these models. Uh, to, to help with speed, to help with accuracy in some settings. Um, so it's, it's uh, some, some very interesting stuff. But um, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.